Salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland. I'm continuing my, cell, my series on uh, English common law, looking a bit at the history of um, English law. So I uh, pointed to when the English uh, Parliament started to meet regularly from 1265, well, fairly regularly. It met at the King's pleasure when he summoned it to meet the two knights from each shire, shire is a county, and two uh, burghers from each borough, as in councillors from each town. Um, so there had been a baronial rebellion against Henry III, led by Simon de Montfort, the Earl of Leicester. And because of him, that's why the city of Leicester's got a university called de Montfort, named in his honour. So any major property holders were permitted to vote. Um, so the House of Commons was the elected element and there was the House of Lords, so aristocrats at this title, Lord, um, they got to go there, bishops, archbishops. Fascinatingly, there were a few women in Parliament at that time. Now, the church owned about a third of the land in England at the time. Remember, about nine out of ten people were farmers. And so farmland was the major economic resource. We went into minerals in those days. Um, and uh, a monastery would own lots of land. There'd be the abbot, who's in charge of the monastery, owned thousands of hectares of land. A convent where nuns were living, the abbess or prioress, whatever the title was for the head nun, she would control thousands of hectares of farmland. Not that the nuns would farm much of it themselves, they'd have tenants who'd pay rent to them. So really, they perceived Parliament as representing land more than people. And that was the fundamental difference in how they saw things. But anyway, because these women, because these important nuns controlled thousands of hectares of farmland, they were quite important people. And they were in the House of Lords as well, just a handful. So there's a tiny, tiny number of women prior to the 20th century were in Parliament, but nevertheless, it proved the point. It became significant, again, in the late, late 19th century, people began debating whether women could enter politics or not. Um, anyway, Parliament was extraordinarily unrepresentative and um, only the very affluent were permitted to vote. So the medieval legislation would say the best men amongst you will choose two representatives, blah, 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 in each um, town or shire. So knights, so a knight was a horse soldier, but not just any horse soldier, had to be able to have a war horse, not just an ordinary nag with a suit of armour, this was super expensive, a bit like a tank on the modern battlefield. One knight was worth easily 10 men on foot. Just think of a fully armoured horse galloping at speed, they can go 60 miles an hour. Even just the horse hitting you, never mind the weapon, would be enough to kill you. So um, anyway, so par Parliament sat rather irregularly. Could meet in London, could meet wherever the king summoned them to meet, sometimes it was Oxford. So parliamentary business we transacted over a few weeks, occasionally a few months. The king would say, Lord, Lord, I want new taxes for this, usually, occasionally new legislation, but quite often the um, uh, parliament would say, we will agree to that on condition that you bring in a new law on this, you repeal that law, and so on, perhaps some appointments. And they didn't formally vote, it was just generally felt that they had assent, and that would happen. Parliament would then be dissolved, go back to your shires, go back to your boroughs, wherever you live, and parliament wouldn't meet for several years until such time as the king chose to meet them again. So the king mainly lived off um, taxes, these imposts were on certain goods that were, pr were produced, or imports, exports, not income tax so much. All right, so on to equity, courts of equity. Uh, law became too rigid in the Middle Ages, hidebound by statute. And sometimes there was no statute to cover a particular situation which had arisen. Therefore, judges developed equitable maxims to allow them to deal with unforeseen situations which weren't uh, provided for by statute. So um, statute law was thought to be harsh and inflexible, and that they did not want to have to adhere strictly to the provisions of statute sometimes. The Lord Chancellor was head of the King's writing department because the King would receive hundreds of letters or other documents per day, more than he could deal with the Chancellor, or more than he could personally deal with. So the Chancellor would be in charge of have plenty of scribes to handle all this. Court records, their decisions, um, uh, so that obviously was related to title deeds, property, who owns what, um, tax payments, who's paid, who's in arrears, correspondence from various aristocrats, 
churchmen, foreign monarchs, and so forth. So the chance, chancellery, chancellery was the was the writing department. That's where you have chancellor, the exchequer, and all the rest of it. Um, so the Lord Chancellor is the head of that, and um, the Lord Chancellor was a priest. Uh, remember, a lot of clergy didn't act as religious leaders as a full time thing. A clergyman could also be a lawyer, a doctor, an accountant, could practice another profession. Only two universities in England, virtually every graduate took holy orders at the time, was a priest. So educated people were clergy. And some of them were serving the state more than they were serving the church. So the Lord Chancellor was father confessor to the king. And remember one of the Catholic sacraments, having to confess to your priest very regularly, saying, these are my sins, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Trying to get these iniquities off your chest, and if you wish to be absolved, well, the your confessor may say, well, you must do this and that for penance and be truly remorseful for your wickedry. So um, the Lord Chancellor would induce um, the monarch to be merciful. If you wish our Saviour to show compassion to you, you must show compassion to others. It's rather rather like a parable. Um, so obviously in more recent centuries, the office of uh, Lord Chancellor has been separated from that of a uh, clergyman. Um, and uh, in the coronation of Elizabeth II, there was the final vestige of this uh, confessorial role. Uh, you, could, you should watch A Queen is Crowned, the, the footage of it. The Archbishop of Canterbury, he's the highest priest in England, he administered the coronation oath to her, and said to her, be thou not so strict that thou forgettest mercy, and be thou not so merciful that thou art remiss. And that was the attitude in the Middle Ages as well. So these various equitable maxims were developed over time uh, in order to um, enable the courts to handle situations which um, um, hadn't been anticipated by uh, statute. The maxims were in Latin, of course, um, and they're often quoted in Latin even to this day. So you could easily do uh, English law not having w learned a word of Latin. Um, but often you know them in Latin, and then you give them the English translation immediately afterwards. So um, I'll just give it to you in English. Uh, he who comes to equity must come with clean hands. That means if you're going to seek equitable relief, you mustn't be malfeasant uh, or have done anything which is sharp practice. That sharp practice being something which is legal, but is close to the limit and reflects uh, moral discredit on you. Um, all right, so sharpsters shall be given short shrift. That's not an equitable maximum. That's my uh, pithy praise of it. Um, equity will not assist those who sleep on their rights. As in, if you wish to make a claim, make it quickly. And this principle applies more generally some of their time limits to take action, to sue. Um, so as soon as you find out your breach of your rights, as soon as practicable, you ought to lodge a claim. So this is how equity developed in parallel to law. This work is terribly confusing. Equity is a type of law, but it's not statute law. And when you go into the law of property, it's very confusing as to whether the, inter the, the interest is legal or equitable. And really, that flummoxed me at times, I must confess. So there were, at those back then, there were the courts of equity and courts of law, and they existed in parallel. They were finally amalgamated by the Judicature Acts of the 1870s. So coming now to the Reformation, I mentioned the church courts, Henry II tried to uh, severely reduce the scope of their jurisdiction um, around a 12, uh, sorry, around 11, no, he became king in 1154, I got that wrong, um, leading up to uh, 1170, but it all went very wrong for him. Anyway, fast forward to the 1530s, English Reformation. So the ecclesiastical courts dealt with clergy. Um, in the 16th century, Henry VIII closed down the Roman Catholic Church and invented the Church of England. In practice, it was the same buildings in almost every case and the same clergy, indeed. Um, I know he got rid of the monasteries gradually, but the actual church buildings for actual worship remained the same. So the ecclesiastical courts lost most of their remit and the church became really just um, an adjunct of the state. Henry VIII was tuning the pulpit, telling the clergy, the what to do, you're more or less his employee, and he who pays the piper calls the tune. So there were trials in the king's courts. Now, 16th century trials would seem farcical to us at best, grossly unjust. Defendants did not have lawyers. Um, prosecution would be led by a lawyer, though, so you can see how there was such inequality of arms. 
defendants were, if they're very lucky, allowed to be present at their own trial, but they were almost never allowed to speak at their own trial, just testimony read out, which was condemnatory of them. Um, so extraordinary thing, they sometimes weren't even present to hear what was being said. Um, the court would hear testimony and see evidence displayed by the prosecution without the defence being allowed to respond most of the time. So you may think this notion of, our oh, fair trial came out of the ark. No, it didn't. What we understand by a fair trial, a lot of it dates from the late 19th century. So um, then uh, go on to the 17th century. That was when 1603, King James, King of Scots, became King of England as well. Sixth of Scots, first of England, same person. Confusingly, we're talking about English law, so let's just call him James I, go by the English regnal number. Um, however, the two separate legal systems remained. Um, England and Wales did not have to copy Scotland, Scotland did not have to copy England, and Wales from 1537, if I've got that right, was represented in the same parliament as England, the English and Welsh parliament, and English law being completely uh, extended to Wales. So Scots law is more Romanized than its English counterpart, part, um, though there are certain commonalities. Um, now, uh, in Ireland, as I say, we were bringing in English law. However, there were some Gaelic chieftains who controlled much of Ireland, um, um, and they were uh, administering the Brehon law, which is our traditional customary law. Um, what else? However, in the 16th century, there'd been the policy of surrender and regrant, these uh, native Irish chieftains, often they had um, renounced their Gaelic titles and taken the title directly from the King of Ireland. So, because from 1542, Henry VIII was King of Ireland. Prior to that, he'd been Lord of Ireland. His predecessors, likewise, had enjoyed that title. Um, anyway, so certainly from the 30, 1530s, perhaps we ought to say English and Welsh law, although it applied to much of Wales even prior to that. Right, Sir Edward Coke is a renowned um, 17th century jurist. And yes, there is some debate over how to pronounce his surname, but it is spelt like Coke, as in Coca-Cola. Um, so uh, he was a famous judge in the early 17th century. Um, James I was uh, wedded to the notion of divine right of kings, believing that he was appointed by Almighty God, and that was that, and his power was untrammeled. He must be obeyed without question, and his duty was to ensure that uh, the right religious beliefs were held by the people and people worshipped in the correct manner, he would have to answer before God at his judgment seat. And it was not for us lesser mortals to question, much less disobey his regal edicts. Um, so uh, people, uh, if, if, if James I chose to grant rights to people, it was just that, a choice. We didn't actually, we're not actually entitled to it. Um, so the king could give us no rights at all because he thought he was semi-divine. He said, by very gods called gods. I thought, isn't that polytheism? Anyway, Sir Edward Coke claimed, no, that is not true. Let's cast our minds back to Magna Carta. The king, is, the, the law is not just whatever the king wants it to be. It can't be annulled by royal fiat, okay? Reject the notion of, well, um, voluntas rex, uh, lex suprema est. That's what some were claiming. Wilhelm II of Germany was later to write that in the golden book of a certain town where he's a visitor. So Coke said that um, royal power was um, strictly limited, it was demarcated by the law, and no one was above the law, and that included the monarch. So there was a, there was a tension in this debate, and James I didn't accept that, obviously it was all to come to a head in the 1640s. So arbitrary power was already being circumscribed in the early 17th century. Gradu judges were becoming more independent, were not necessarily returning the, exec the, the, the verdict that the executive wanted them to do. Well, sorry, verdict. I know they can intervene. It's really up to the jury to decide the, to, to decide the verdict. But judges can order a jury to find someone not guilty. Highly unusual for that to happen. Or to hand down whatever um, uh, penalty, um, whatever sentence that the monarch would see fit. Certainly in the 1530s, Henry VIII would make it abundantly clear that he wanted a certain verdict and a certain punishment. For instance, in relation to the trial of his wife, Anne Boleyn presided over by her uncle. Now you might think Nemo Eudex in causa sua, he who would be uh, inclined towards her, but Henry VIII said that your family's on trial and basically you've got to give me the verdict you want or you too will be punished. You've got to show how much you're outraged by your niece's adultery. 
All right, that's enough in this video for the moment.